Part Two, Chapter Seventeen of Burning Daylight by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For months, Daylight was buried in work. The outlay was terrific, and there was nothing coming in. Beyond a general rise in land values, Oakland had not acknowledged his eruption on the financial scene. The city was waiting for him to show what he was going to do, and he lost no time about it. The best skilled brains on the market were hired by him for the different branches of the work. Initial mistakes he had no patience with, and he was determined to start right, as when he engaged Wilkinson, almost doubling his big salary, and brought him out from Chicago to take charge of the street railway organization. Night and day the road gangs toiled on the streets, and night and day the pile drivers hammered the big piles down into the mud of San Francisco Bay. The pier was to be three miles long, and the Berkeley Hills were denuded of whole groves of mature eucalyptus for the piling. At the same time that as electric roads were building out through the hills, the hay fields were being surveyed and broken up into city squares, with here and there, according to best modern methods, winding boulevards and strips of park. Broad streets well graded were made, with sewers and water pipes ready laid and macadamized from his own quarries. Cement sidewalks were also laid, so that all the purchaser had to do was to select his lot and architect and start building. The quick service of Daylight's new electric roads into Oakland made this big district immediately accessible, and long before the ferry system was in operation, hundreds of residences were going up. The profit on this land was enormous. In a day, his onslaught of wealth had turned open farming country into one of the best residential districts of the city. But this money that flowed in upon him was immediately poured back into his other investments. The need for electric cars was so great that he installed his own shops for building them. And even on the rising land market, he continued to buy choice factory sites and building properties. On the advice of Wilkinson, practically every electric road already in operation was rebuilt. The light, old-fashioned rails were torn out and replaced by the heaviest that were manufactured. Corner lots on the sharp turns of narrow streets were bought and ruthlessly presented to the city in order to make wide curves for his tracks and high speed for his cars. Then, too, there were the mainline feeders for his ferry system, tapping every portion of Oakland, Almeida, and Berkeley, and running fast expresses to the pier end. The same large-scale methods were employed in the water system. Service of the best was needed, if his huge land investment was to succeed. Oakland had to be made into a worthwhile city, and that was what he intended to do. In addition to his big hotels, he built amusement parks for the common people, and art galleries and clubhouse country inns for the more finicky classes. Even before there was any increase in population, a marked increase in street railway traffic took place. There was nothing fanciful about his schemes. They were sound investments. What Oakland wants is a first-class theater, he said, and after vainly trying to interest local capital, he started the building of the theater himself, for he alone had vision for the 200,000 new people that were coming to the town. No matter what pressure was on daylight, his Sundays he reserved for his riding in the hills. It was not the winter weather, however, that brought these rides with Dede to an end. One Saturday afternoon in the office, she told him not to expect to meet her next day, and when he pressed for an explanation, I've sold Mab. Daylight was speechless for the moment. Her act meant one of so many serious things that he couldn't classify it. It smacked almost of treachery. 
she might have met with financial disaster. It might be her way of letting him know she had seen enough of him, or... What's the matter? he managed to ask. I couldn't afford to keep her with hay, forty-five dollars a ton, Dee Dee answered. Was that your only reason, he demanded, looking at her steadily, for he remembered her once telling him how she had bought the mare through one winter, five years before, when hay had gone as high as sixty dollars a ton. No, my brother's expenses have been higher as well, and I was driven to the conclusion that since I could not afford both, I'd better let the mayor go and keep the brother. Daylight felt inexpressibly saddened. He was suddenly aware of a great emptiness. What would a Sunday be without Dee Dee, and Sundays without end without her? He drummed perplexedly on the desk with his fingers. Who brought her? he asked. Dee Dee's eyes flashed in the way long since familiar to him, when she was angry. "'Don't you dare buy her back for me,' she cried, "'and don't deny that that was what you had in mind.' "'I won't deny it. It was my idea to a T. But I wouldn't have done it without asking you first, and seeing how you feel about it, I won't even ask you. But you thought a heap of that mare, and it's pretty hard on you to lose her. I'm sure sorry, and I'm sorry, too, that you won't be riding with me tomorrow. I'll be plumb lost. I won't know what to do with myself. Neither shall I, Dede confessed mournfully, except that I shall be able to catch up with my sewing. But I haven't any sewing. Daylight's tone was whimsically plaintive, but secretly he was delighted with her confession of loneliness. It was almost worth the loss of her mare to get that out of her. At any rate, he meant something to her. He was not utterly unlike. I wish you would reconsider, Miss Mason, he said softly, not alone for the mayor's sake, but for my sake. Money don't cut any ice in this. For me to buy that mayor wouldn't mean as much as it does to most men to send a bouquet of flowers or a box of candy to a young lady. And I've never sent you flowers or candy. He observed the warning flash of her eyes and hurried on to escape refusal. I'll tell you what we'll do. Suppose I buy the mare and own her myself and lend her to you when you want to ride. There's nothing wrong in that. Anybody borrows a horse from anybody, you know. Again he saw refusal and headed her off. Lots of men take women buggy riding. There's nothing wrong in that and the man always furnishes the horse and buggy. Well, now, what's the difference between my taking you buggy riding and furnishing the horse and buggy and taking you horseback riding and furnishing the horses? She shook her head and declined to answer, at the same time looking at the door as if to intimate that it was time for this unbusinesslike conversation to end. He made one more effort. Do you know, Miss Mason, I haven't a friend in the world outside you. I mean a real friend, man or woman. The kind you chum with, you know, and that you're glad to be with and sorry to be away from. Hagen is the nearest man I get to, and he's a million miles away from me. Outside business, we don't hitch. He's got a big library of books and some crazy kind of culture. He spends all his off times reading things in French and German and other outlandish lingos, when he ain't writing plays and poetry. There's nobody I feel chummy with except you, and you know how little we've chummed once a week, if it didn't rain on Sunday. I've grown kind of to depend upon you. You're sort of a, a... A sort of a habit, she said with a smile. That's about it. And that mare, and you astride her, coming along the road under the trees, or through the sunshine. Why, with both you and the mayor missing, there won't be anything worth waiting through the week for. If you just let me buy her back. No, no, I tell you no. Dee Dee rose impatiently, but her eyes were moist with the memory of her pet. Please don't mention her to me again. If you think it was easy to part with her, you are mistaken. 
but I've seen the last of her, and I want to forget her. Daylight made no answer, and the door closed behind him. Half an hour later he was conferring with Jones, the erstwhile elevator boy and rabbit proletarian whom Daylight long before had grub-staked to literature for a year. The resulting novel had been a failure. Editors and publishers would not look at it. And now Daylight was using this disgruntled author in a little private secret service system he had been compelled to establish for himself. Jones, who affected to be surprised at nothing after his crushing experience with railroad freight rates on firewood and charcoal, betrayed no surprise now when the task was given to him to locate the purchaser of a certain sorrel mare. "'How high shall I pay for her?' he asked. "'Any price. You've got to get her. That's the point. Drive a sharp bargain so as not to excite suspicion, but buy her. Then you deliver her to that address up in Sonoma County. The man's a caretaker on that little ranch I have there. Tell him to take whacking good care of her. After that, forget all about it. Don't tell me the name of the man you buy her from. Don't tell me anything about it, except you've got her and delivered her. Savvy? But the week had not passed when Daylight noted the flash in Deedee's eyes that boded trouble. Something's gone wrong, what is it? he asked boldly. Mab, she said. The man who bought her has sold her already. If I thought you had anything to do with it. I don't even know who you sold her to, was Daylight's answer. And what's more, I'm not bothering my head about her. She was your mare, and it's none of my business what you did with her. You haven't got her, that's sure, and worse luck. And now, while we're on touchy subjects, I'm going to open another one with you. And you needn't get touchy about it, for it's not really your business at all. She waited in the pause that followed, eyeing him almost suspiciously. It's about that brother of yours. He needs more than you can do for him. Selling that mayor of yours won't send him to Germany, and that's what his own doctors say he needs. That crack German specialist who rips a man's bones and muscles into pulp and then molds them all over again. Well, I want to send him to Germany and give that crack a flutter, that's all. If it were only possible, she said, half breathlessly, and wholly without anger, only it isn't, and you know it isn't. I can't accept money from you. Hold on now, he interrupted. Wouldn't you accept a drink of water from one of the twelve apostles if you was dying of thirst? Or would you be afraid of his evil intentions? She made a gesture of dissent or of what folks might say about it. But that's different, she began. Now look here, Miss Mason. You've got to get some foolish notions out of your head. The money notion is one of the funniest things I've seen. Suppose you was falling over a cliff. Wouldn't it be all right for me to reach out and hold you by the arm? Sure it would. But suppose you needed another sort of help. Instead of the strength of an arm, the strength of my pocket. That would be all, and that's what they'd all say. But why do they say it? Because the robber gangs want all the suckers to be honest and respect money. If the suckers weren't honest and didn't respect money, where would the robbers be? Don't you see? The robbers don't deal in arm holds, they deal in dollars. Therefore arm holds are just common and ordinary, while dollars are sacred, so sacred that you didn't let me lend you a hand with a few. Or here's another way, he continued, spurred on by her mute protest. It's all right for me to give the strength of my arm when you're falling over a cliff. But if I take the same strength of arm and use it at pick-and-shovel work for a day and earn two dollars, you won't have anything to do with the two dollars. Yet it's the same old strength of arm in a new form, that's all. Besides, in this proposition, it won't be a claim on you. It ain't even a loan to you. It's an arm hold I'm giving your brother. Just the same sort of arm hold 
as if he were falling over a cliff. And a nice one you are, to come running out and yell stop at me and let your brother go on over the cliff. What he needs to save his legs is that crack in Germany, and that's the arm hold I'm offering. Wish you could see my rooms. Walls all decorated with horsehair bridles, scores of them, hundreds of them. They're no use to me, and they cost like Sam Scratch. But there's a lot of convicts making them, and I go on buying. Well, I've spent more money in a single night on whiskey than would get the best specialists and pay all the expenses of a dozen cases like your brother's. And remember, you've got nothing to do with this. If your brother wants to look on it as a loan, all right. It's up to him, and you've got to stand out of the way while I pull him back from that cliff. Still, Dee Dee refused, and Daylight's argument took a more painful turn. I can only guess that you're standing in your brother's way on account of some mistaken idea in your head that this is my idea of courting. Well, it ain't. You might as well think I'm courting all those convicts I buy bridles from. I haven't asked you to marry me, and if I do, I won't come trying to buy you into consenting, and there won't be anything underhanded when I come a-asking. Dede's face was flushed and angry. If you knew how ridiculous you are, you'd stop, she blurted out. You can make me more uncomfortable than any man I ever knew. Every little while you give me to understand that you haven't asked me to marry you yet. I'm not waiting to be asked, and I warned you from the first that you had no chance. And yet you hold it over my head that sometime, some day, you're going to ask me to marry you. Go ahead and ask me now and get your answer and get it over and done with. He looked at her in honest and pondering admiration. I want you so bad, Miss Mason, that I don't dast to ask you now, he said, with such whimsicality and earnestness as to make her throw back her head in a frank, boyish laugh. Besides, as I told you, I'm green at it. I never went a courtin' before, and I don't want to make any mistakes. But you're making them all the time, she cried impulsively. No man ever courted a woman by holding a threatened proposal over her head like a club. I won't do it any more, he said humbly, and anyway, we're off the argument. My straight talk a minute ago still holds. You're standing in your brother's way. No matter what notions you've got in your head, you've got to get out of the way and give him a chance. Will you let me go and see him and talk it over with him? I'll make it a hard and fast business proposition. I'll stake him to get well, that's all, and charge him interest. She visibly hesitated. And just remember one thing, Miss Mason. It's his leg, not yours. She refrained from giving her answer, and daylight went on, strengthening his position. And remember, I go over to see him alone. He's a man, and I can deal with him better without women folks around. I'll go over tomorrow afternoon. End of Part 2 Chapter 17